trained disciples to wake up on Resurrection Sunday. And they didn't. They didn't call it Resurrection Sunday. Because <laughs> but to wake up with such know that that crushing defeat is going to absolutely shift. Right? And the hope that comes with the resurrection. I want us to turn this morning to 1 Corinthians 15. Amen. As you're turning there, 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. And, and Paul wrote this, and for Paul, the resurrection was the turning point in human history. We're celebrating the turning point in human history today. Wow. Amen. That everything changed, and it was a transition from an age of promise to an age of fulfillment. You realize we're living in an age of fulfillment, right? Now, there are still things that need to be fulfilled, still things that the Lord has declared in his word that are yet to come. But the kingdom is here. Amen. And it has come because of the resurrection. It has come because of Jesus' ascension. And no event in human history had more riding on it than the resurrection. Right? And throughout the New Testament, the resurrection is viewed as the vindication and the validation of the message and the mission of Jesus. You know, you can't really claim to be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. Right? right? Let's read this. Let's read out of 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found, found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ when he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are, all, are of all men most to be pitied. Wow. Now, to me, sometimes you read scriptures, and you ever read scripture knowing that you can turn it? Right? If you turn it and read this and say, if Christ has been raised, our preaching is not in vain, right? Our faith is not in vain. And um, if the dead are raised, even Christ has been raised, amen? You realize that Christ was the firstborn, right? The first fruits of resurrection from the dead. What does that mean about your life today? Not only have you spiritually been raised from the dead, but there is a moment, and we'll get to this later on, but there will be a moment that you too will be resurrected physically out of death, right? That you too will have an eternal, immortal body that you'll put on, right? And that we're not just going to be spirits floating around in heaven, right? But we'll have a physical body. Jesus is before the Father right now in a physical body that bears the marks of the crucifixion. That were marks of the covenant that he made so that we could become children of God. He's before Christ, before the Father in that physical body. And I, I rejoice in the fact that Christ has risen from the dead. Right Now, we're going to look for a few moments. At some things. And first of all, I want to look at um, historical evidence for the resurrection. Come on. Right? There's a lot of historical evidence for the resurrection because some people are like, you know, I think Jesus was great. But this resurrection stuff is just insanity. Well, there's a lot of historical evidence that points to the reality of that. We're going to look at some of that this morning and then we're going to get to. What exactly the resurrection meant. Amen. First of all, 
Jesus was crucified by the Romans around the A.D. 30. Right? Contrary to popular belief, the Jews did not crucify Jesus. Come on. It was the Romans, right, that crucified him. No credible scholar denies this reality and this truth. Now, some people are like, well, we're not sure that Jesus really died on the cross. And he got off the cross and he recovered from that. Well, <laughs> it's inconceivable that Jesus did not die on the cross. As we talked about last week, um, you know, most people didn't survive the flogging that happened before being put on the cross. And so the Romans were very, very good at what they did. Right? And he did die on the cross, and the cross was so cruel that I believe it was about an A.D. 315 that they actually outlawed crucifixion because it was so brutal. Right? Also, it's historical fact that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. All four Gospels talk about this and confirm that Joseph, and interestingly enough, Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the group of the Pharisees that actually agreed that Jesus needed to die. Right? Isn't that interesting? Would you, that you, the Gospel writers recorded that the same group that said Jesus is worthy of death, it was one of them that took Jesus and put him in his own tomb, right? And this is probably not a false story, considering that it was the Sanhedrin that said, yes, he needs to die. Let's send him to Pilate, the Roman governor, right? Now, Paul confirms this reality, and we're still in 1 Corinthians 15, but I want us to back up and, and see what Paul says in verses 3 through 8. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Isn't that interesting? You know, Paul's verifying that Christ was died, he was buried in the tomb, and, uh, and that Paul received this. Paul knew Peter, he knew James, he knew all these guys. And so he's giving account of what happened. And then it's really powerful because Paul begins to list the numerous people who encountered the risen Christ before his ascension. More than 500 at one moment. Right? Not just the women at the tomb, not just the disciples, but he appeared to over 500 people. You know, we always joke about this and, you know, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. But only 120 were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Where were all the others? Right, that's another sermon. <laughs> but hunger really does pay off. Yeah. Right. Because those who were present in the upper room for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what a moment. Yeah. Right. But Jesus appeared to so many people. Right. So then the, there's the reality that the fact that the tomb was discovered empty on the third day. Okay? Now, it's interesting to me because who were the first witnesses to the empty tomb? It was women. Right? And actually, the first person to preach the gospel of the risen Christ was actually a woman. Oh my gosh. Right? Now, if you want to get the news spread, who do you tell? You tell a woman. They are good communicators. They are very effective in rapid communication. <laughs> right? 
Right? That's what I was talking about. That's what I meant. Come on. <laughs> but you know what's interesting about that? If if this if the resurrection was kind of this not real story and they were fabricating it, the gospel writers would have never recorded that women found the empty tomb first. Because at that point in history, I'm sorry to say, women were not considered reliable witnesses. So it's very brave for all the gospel writers. If they were making up a story, they would not say it was the women that found the empty tomb first. Right? So it's an interesting reality that they place this initial discovery on the tomb on women. If the tomb was not empty, the early church would not have started preaching immediately in Jerusalem. Why? Because some people are like, well, you know, the disciples, they kind of, they faked this whole thing. And they took the body out of the tomb, they stole it, and then they started preaching immediately. Well... The tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers who had just killed the guy they were following. And they were all in hiding, thinking everything was over. I mean, my gosh, some of us barely recovered from, let me rephrase this carefully. <laughs> A lot of times we have a hard time recovering when our candidate doesn't get elected for president. <laughs> what if the person that you've given your life to for three years suddenly has been executed? Everything you've lived for is gone, and you're next in line. I wouldn't be going stealing a body from the same people who were going to kill me too. Right? And even if you, the body hadn't been stolen, was still present, and you start preaching in Jerusalem, all everybody has to do is say, here's this dead body. But they fearlessly yeah. began yeah. to preach on the streets of Jerusalem. Right. And there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And all Jerusalem knew what they were saying was true because the body was gone. Right? There's something that changed the lives of these guys. Suddenly, they were fearless in preaching the gospel. Right? And they knew that it was not only true, but they had to tell everybody because they were summoning people. They were inviting them in an urgency into the kingdom of God. Wow. Amen. Their lives were turned upside down. And I think not only because of the resurrection, but because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit yeah. that would come days later and empower them to be witnesses. And not only witnesses who declare, but witnesses who gave their lives and were unafraid to die. I was talking about this in chapel this week with the kids and how, you know, that everybody all hid and was denied Jesus. And then there came that moment when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they'd seen the risen Christ. He'd eaten with them. He walked into their midst. He taught them things about the kingdom of God, even after his resurrection. They were willing to say, God, we're going to take this gospel. Because there's a world that urgently needs to hear the message of the risen Christ. And we'll lay down our lives. To plunder heaven, to plunder hell, and populate heaven. And they were every one of those twelve apostles were all martyred, with the exception of John, who was thrown into boiling oil, church tradition says, and didn't die. They couldn't kill him. Right? 
which is freaky. I'm, can you imagine being an oiling oil? <coughs> right? I'm not burning. I'm not a crawfish. Praise the Lord, everybody. Right? And they threw him on the Isle of Patmos so that he would starve to death. And you know what happened instead? <coughs> had visions in Revelation. Open heaven, he came up. The angel comes and says, come up here. There are things I have to show you. Come on, come up higher. Wow. And he wrote the book of Revelation and he went on throughout his life and, and challenged Gnosticism and false doctrines that were trying to permeate all the church. That's fun stuff, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Right? These guys were all willing to lay down their lives. Because they'd seen the risen Christ. And they'd seen him say, look, touch the nail prints in my hands. Touch where the spear pierced my side. Look, it's here. I'm bearing the marks of my crucifixion before the Father. Ren's excited. The disciples were changed because of an empty tomb and a resurrected Christ. It's also interesting that Christians suddenly started worshiping on the first day of the week to commemorate an event. And church history tells us that throughout history that the church began meeting very early on Sunday mornings to commemorate the resurrection, shifting from the traditional Sabbath worship to Sunday morning. There weren't Seventh-day Adventists. Um, nothing against that group. We bless the Seventh-day Adventist church here in our city. Amen. But they begin to worship on early, early Sunday morning. And most of them would worship early on Sunday morning and then go to their jobs because Christianity for many years was outlawed. Right? Many credible witnesses, again, moving on for historical fact, many credible witnesses saw Jesus alive. And we just read that list from the book of, uh, from Paul in 1 Corinthians. The Gospels and the book of Acts record 10 accounts of people Encountering Jesus between his resurrection and his ascension. And some people are like, well, it's just a hallucination. It's just hysteria. Right? It's kind of like people who've seen Bigfoot. <laughs> Two million dollars. Two million dollars. I would go hunt for him, but I'm scared. Um, these weren't hallucinations. Because here's the reality, Jews, the Jews' view of the Jewish view of resurrection was very specific. Right? They believed in a resurrection in the future. And we're going to read a scripture about it in a moment. It's just really interesting to me. They believed in a resurrection. So a physical, literal resurrection. For, so for them to say, well, this is just Jesus was a spirit. Right? Appearing to people. No, he's a the Bible is very specific about reporting that he had a physical body. That on the road to Emmaus, he sat with those, those guys and he ate fish with them. Right? It might have been crawfish, I don't know. But uh, there are all these accounts. And if this had just been somewhat, some people are like, well, you know, stuff like that happens and it just becomes a legend. Legends generally take time. This was immediate. These guys immediately began to preach about the resurrection. Amen. And because of the resurrection theology of the Pharisees and Jews, Paul would have never written about this. He spends a lot of time in 1 Corinthians 15 talking about a physical body that not only Jesus received, but a physical glorified body that we all will receive one day. Isn't that exciting that you're going to have a glorified body someday. And it won't be sick. You won't be subject to the Rona. 
Right? I think I'm going to have abs of steel. Right? I think a glorified body should have that, right? Probably not going to care. Probably not going to care. So let's talk about the significance of the resurrection. Let's turn to Daniel 12. Amen. And you know, a lot of times we don't think about that there, there really is, there was a Jewish theology of resurrection. Not only, they didn't have the full picture yet. Right? They knew that there would be a resurrection, but they hadn't brought in completely the understanding of Messiah. And so I want to read Daniel 12, beginning in verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. Those to everlast these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace in everlasting contempt. Man, I, I want to be resurrected to everlasting life. Right? Not to everlasting contempt. That does not sound fun. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Man, that's a powerful passage from the Old Testament looking forward to a moment not only of the resurrection. Right? Now, I, I want to be resurrected to righteousness. I want to be resurrected to everlasting life, not everlasting contempt. That doesn't sound fun. Right? But there's this reality, even before the resurrection, I think verse 3 talks about those. If you have insight, some translations say wisdom, you will shine brightly like the brightness. And those who lead many to righteousness, like stars in the If you want to lead many to righteousness, guess what? The side result of that is you shine like the stars in the heavens. Right? I think we can partake of some of that right now. Right? What an incredible promise. So there's this reality of, of Daniel talking about there's this future resurrection. Right? The judgment, and sometimes judgment's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. But there's a good resurrection for the believer that's coming. And even then, later on, the, the book of Colossians records in Colossians 1.18, and I'll just read it. But that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. He's a firstborn. He's, he's a first fruit in his resurrection of what's coming for you as a believer. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 again. Paul talking a lot about this. The mystery of the resurrection beginning in verse 50. Because the, the, the resurrection was a transition from a past longing of fulfillment into a new moment, the beginning of immortal, imperishable resurrection life. Amen. Do you know you passed, if you belong to Jesus, you pass out of death. You already are partaking of eternal life. Hallelujah. Right? You've stepped into eternal life. You've stepped into something new. Now, this physical body, it is going to, unless that moment when 
Jesus manifests and we fully manifest the kingdom on earth, right? Some of us will pass, right? Some of us will sleep, Paul says. Some of us will be resurrected out of dust. Right? Let's read what Paul says about this, beginning in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, in, the perishable inherit the perishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable, we will put on the imperishable will have put on the imperishable. This mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about saying the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. For the believer, death is swallowed up in victory. It's defeated. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, now whenever there's a therefore in Scripture, you have to see what it's there for. It's deep, isn't it? So because of all these things we just read, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Everything that you're doing, and Scripture does talk about working for the Lord. That's not a popular message right now. Grace, grace, grace. We don't have to work. Well, this says we toil in the Lord. But it's not in vain because of all the magnificent promises that we've been given. And even, according to Daniel, if we're leading people to righteousness, wow. we're shining like the stars in the heavens. Right? And we've already put on Immortality. Now our body still, you know, I look at my, the mirror and I'm like, my body is wasting away. Some parts, some parts are not wasting away. Right? I need a little, little help in a lot of areas. Right? Where's that immortality? But there's there's righteousness, the resurrection. Is the resurrection powers within us the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you? Right. There'll come a moment. I don't know what that moment's going to look like. Right. We can read certain things in Scripture about what's going to happen in the last trumpet in the twinkling of an eye when Jesus manifests the kingdom on earth. What will that look like? I don't know, but I'm excited about it. I'm excited about that transition, which we've already begun. We're in a new age of immortality. And even that means even when the world around us is going crazy, take on the eternal perspective. Take on that understanding that there's eternity that we're living in at this moment. The resurrection was the defeat of Satan. 
And there were times that Jesus came into conflict with the enemy. Times he came into conflict, con conflict with demons, with devils, and he concisely, effectively defeated them. But it was still a temporary thing. But there's something that came with the cross, with the resurrection, that Jesus defeated the enemy. He defeated sin, and he defeated death. More than a temporary victory. Now, are, are there still areas that we still have to take the kingdom and overcome? Yeah. Absolutely. The kingdom is now, and everything that we have is present in the kingdom. But there's still ground that we have to take right. by the power of the cross. And Jesus, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, he understood these things. First of all, he understood that his life was an atoning sacrifice for sin. We talked about that a lot last week. He understood that he was reversing the effects of the fall. That he was defeating Satan. And that he was restoring creation to its rightful relationship. God created man and woman and set them in a garden and said, fill the earth with my glory. Right? I've set you in this one place on the earth. I've given you the kingdom. Now go and fill the earth with my glory. Now, they messed up. But with Jesus' death, his resurrection, that same glory that was in the garden, he's given to his people. Those who've named themselves, those who've been marked by his life, those who've been marked by his sacrifice and his resurrection. And he's saying to his church, go and fill the earth with my glory. Right. There's something about when we gather, I know, you know, I was I was so sad last year yeah. when we couldn't gather on Resurrection Sunday. Right. And we kind of tried to plan to do it, and I physically just couldn't because of some reasons. And, and uh, this, this year I was so thankful. Yeah. Lord, we get to gather. Yeah. Thankfully, we've been gathering for months. Yeah. Yeah. But we get to gather because... The enemy has tried to rob yeah, the church. Yeah. And I know there are good reasons not to gather. I mean, I, I know all those things. But there's something about the enemy has tried to rob the yeah, church yeah, yeah. from coming together in his name and releasing his glory to fill the earth. And he's tried to muzzle the people of God. earth needs us. The earth needs our voice. The nations need our worship. You know, some people have criticized Sean Foyt for gathering. And you know, revival always brings criticism. Because revival usually is radical. Yeah. And it's usually risky. And it usually costs us something. Yeah. Our time. Usually revival costs your reputation. What's that? Your money. Right. I mean, we talk about Toronto that went on for 20 years. How much toilet paper was that? That's a lot of toilet paper. What's that? Especially when people steal it. When we have events, people steal our toilet paper. 
I'm just like, take it in there. <laughs> just saying, you're that desperate. <laughs> Stuff those rolls in your bag. This Resurrection Sunday, God's calling His people to be radical. He's given us, through His resurrection, through His life, that same glory that was in Eden. And He's saying, we need one another. We learned that from a culture of honor. We need one yeah, another. Because yeah. when you gather together, you release the glory of God. That's right. Now there's more than gathering. We have to go too. Because right. the harvest is all around us. Yeah. Jesus said, man, I'm not praying. And he said, pray this way. Don't just pray for the harvest. Pray that laborers be thrust into the harvest. Look around you. Go and fill the earth with the glory of God. Understanding that you go commissioned by the risen Lord. And his last thing he said to his, to his followers, and he's still speaking, the last thing he said from his earthly body on the earth until he ascended was to go and make disciples of all the nations. Wow. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission. I read a statistic of the other day that less than, only about 50% of the church or less even knows what the Great Commission is. This really saddens me. You and Global Harvest, you know. You know that the harvest is ripe and we've been commissioned to go and to preach the gospel of the resurrected Lord. Paul, Paul went was so determined, even when people were prophesying to him, dude, you're going to be bound and you're going to die. Accurate prophecy? Maybe given with a little bit of understanding being off? That happens sometimes, doesn't it? Those guys weren't false prophets. But Paul said, I'm going to Jerusalem anyway. I'm willing to give my life because the gospel must be preached. is a moment because of the resurrection. But there is an intensity of the Holy Spirit that he's wanting to burn in us to go and declare that Christ is risen. And it demands a decision from our lives. So this morning, as you go and as you celebrate with family and you hunt eggs, if that's your thing, right? whatever you do, understand that you've been commissioned to fill the earth with the glory of God on this holiday. Go and fill the earth with His glory. Amen. Now, I want us to take a moment Celebrate communion together. Hallelujah. We're going to turn to the book of Matthew. And I had it in my notes. And I love communion. Amen. Sorry, you guys. Look 
did that day in these notes. So let's just turn to First Corinthians. You know, Jamie and I have been celebrating communion every morning this week. Because there are things that we need in our lives. Amen. And there's power in communion. And so this morning as we celebrate communion, if you have need, and I know we all have need in one area or the other, we all have great need. So I want you to come and approach the Lord's table knowing that it really is a table of grace. And it is a table that we can partake of. And if you need to repent of something, repent. Say, God, I, I need to repent. I'm struggling in this area. So, Lord, I repent. I turn away. And, Lord, I receive the grace that you give. Grace not to keep doing what I've been doing, but grace, supernatural power, supernatural endowment to actually change my life by the power of the Lord's table. If you're sick in body, approach the Lord's table saying, man, there's, there's healing that comes through the atonement. Sometimes we have people get healed in communion with no one laying hands on it. It's powerful. I love it. If you're sick today, come understanding that there's resurrection in my DNA. And I come to receive today. Amen. So let's read this out of 1 Corinthians 12. Sorry, 11 verse 23. For I received from the Lord. Now it's interesting. Paul talked earlier about I received this from others, but this I received from the Lord. That which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we partake of this today, we're proclaiming his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And we are going to receive. And as we do communion here, most of you have been through communion here. We come up, we take the elements, we go back to our seats or kneel wherever and we play. The music and you guys just partake of it on your own. It's a very, very holy moment and a very powerful moment. Receive what the Father wants to do as you do that. Amen. So let's just partake of communion. Lord, we thank you for these elements today. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the body. Thank you for the new covenant that's in your blood. Thank you that you deliver us from the power of sin, sickness grave because of the atonement. And we just celebrate and bless these elements today.